today on Daring Abroad. We do have samosa, we do have masala fries, we have choma. A taste of home while in the USA. Why this Kenyan couple is bringing a taste of Africa to Oklahoma. I wanted to represent where we come from. Also on the show. We want to have some Kenyan street names. Mm -hmm. We want that uh, when the folks come in here, mm. they can tell that um, we were here. 39 acres of land in Dallas, Texas for affordable housing. How an investment group of 68 Kenyans are conquering real estate in the U.S. Yes, you've heard it right. 68 daring Kenyan investors in Dallas, Texas, pulling resources to purchase 39 acres of land for a massive affordable housing project that will be worth about 6 billion Kenya shillings once complete. How daring. Yes, you are in time for this show. And we join Mr. and Mrs. Momani who are running a restaurant and food truck business in Oklahoma under the brand Attest. Of Africa. Busy doing what she is good at, busy preparing some test of Africa for the Champs Media crew. Yes. Stacy Momani's kitchen is where her aroma of African delicacies begins. This restaurant is strategically located in downtown Oklahoma City. Stacy runs this business together with her husband, Brian Momani, and what makes them even more busy is outside catering across the U.S. They also have a food truck that operates not only in Oklahoma, but also in the neighboring states like Texas and Kansas. Why 254, a taste of Africa? What made you choose that name? Uh, so 254 is the Kenyan area code, plus 254 is the Kenyan area code, so I wanted to uh, represent where we come from, both me and my husband, and then a taste of Africa is what our mission and vision is: is to bring a taste of Africa to the United States. To bring the to bring a taste of Africa in the United States. Expound a little more. When you say to bring a taste of Africa in the United States, what do you mean? So by that I mean that I wanted to bring a taste of Africa by bringing the uh, authentic African food to the people of the United States. Mm -hmm majority not people from Africa that are the ones that are here so we wanted to make sure that everywhere in the United States someone can have a taste of Africa and by the taste is we are bringing our cuisine to them. So with food truck, what the food truck is, it's just a mobile kitchen. Mm -hmm. So that enables me to go anywhere and be able to prepare our food and serve our food to anybody wherever they are. Mm. So we have our complete kitchen in the food truck. All we need to do is just buy the food and we can make any mm -hmm. dish from our food truck. So we started off with a food truck. We ran it, we started off in 2021, right after COVID. And we got a little bit of footing on it, good traction on it. So we decided, why not? Why not just have a restaurant? Because most of the people, people who are not able to get us on the food truck, they'll come at the restaurant. So that's where the idea of the restaurant came about. So normally we do like birthday parties, corporate events, family gatherings, uh, community events. Like, you know, us Kenyans, we love to get together like Dallas Memorial. Mm -hmm. Whenever we have Dallas Memorial, we take our food truck to Texas for that. We also do different festivals like the reggae festivals. We've done the art festival here in mm -hmm. Oklahoma City. So we just attend different festivals and share our meals with other people. Is this love, is this love, is this love? So I've known Stacy and Momani for over 15 years. And when they started their business, you know, we all came together to support them. They are a pillar of this community as far as the Kenyans are concerned. And uh, they primarily make African Kenyan dishes. And the people here just love it. Brian and Stacy are hands-on entrepreneurs. 
a lot depends on their input. So we have something called powers of separation. <laughs> My wife mostly runs the restaurant and I run the food truck. And more so because food truck is more engaging. You have to have more, a little bit of muscle on it because of the, just some of the stuff that we do in the back. So for the food truck in America, so we try and run it at least three times a week. For those people who are not make it, able to make it at the restaurant, they can always come to the food truck. Uh, most of the times we run it Tuesday, from Tuesday during dinner time, same thing for Thursday. And Sunday we do it like all day because we know people are going to church, so they'll be able to come uh, have their meals for lunch and dinner as well. There are strict regulations in the food industry, and what keeps the Momanyis afloat is the ability to abide by the regulations. We have a food inspector who comes, checks the meals. Our fridge has to be at a certain temperature. And just some of those things that we do behind the scenes as well. So who is their clientele? We have people from all races. I will tell you that you'll be very surprised when people come to the restaurant or come to the food truck and specifically ask about fish, the tilapia fish. And I tell them, hey, it has the head, they're like, you know what, I'll go ahead and just have that. But it's just more about the diversity of it. Uh, we have Americans, we have people from South America, we have people from even North America. So we just have people from all over coming to our restaurant to have our meals. I import my spices from Kenya, but I buy my spices individually, then I create my own spice combination. Plus 254, actually, I did not mention that. We also have a spice line. Mm. We create our own pilau masala. We create our own tea masala, mm. which you even tasted from <laughs> the tea yes. and identified something was different. We also have a plus 254 mix spices mm. and curry powder. So I just get different natural spices from Kenya, and then I do the combination by mm. myself. The story of the Momanyis is an inspiration to many back home. I was born in Nairobi, Kenya. I went to my lower primary in Nairobi. Then I transferred and went to primary school in St. Anne's Girls Mumias. Mm. Then I moved to Butere Girls High School. Uh -huh. Attended USIU for my first year of college. In, then in I moved course to the did you United study States. At USIU? I did international relations at international USIU. International relations at USIU. Born and raised in Nairobi, Kenya, and I'm from Kisi, Nyamira. <laughs> for those who are kisses, <laughs> we, can, we can cook too. <laughs> Straight from the motherland. Straight eh? from the motherland. So I came to the U.S. in 2008, and when I came, I just came because of school. I went to school, I graduated. Uh, in school, I was able to meet my wife. We actually met in a history class, and you can imagine the rest was history. Yes. <laughs> um, and after that, we got married. We had kids, two beautiful kids, Jabari and Taya. And after that, we were able to start a business. She always had the urge just to want to cook for people. We used to host uh, people at our houses just to eat, you know. I would invite one or two people just to come sample the kind of food that we have. And that's how we just got that momentum in maintaining that spirit to make sure that we, we start from somewhere. Brian and Stacy are birds of a feather. They both worked in the corporate world at some point before quitting their jobs to venture into this. So before I ventured into this, I was an accountant at a payroll company, mm. one of the largest payroll companies in the US. I worked there for seven years mm -hmm. and then I had to leave the job to do this full time. And my boss was very, very favoring to me because he lets me cater their lunches mm. for them. Wow. So 254 goes to Paycom to cater lunches. That, he gave you business? Yes, so <laughs> well, now we have we're doing business together. Oh, that is interesting. That's daring. You leave your job and then you dare into the outside world and you still get a job from your former, former employer. Yes. Wow. Yes. The Momanyis have learned that discipline, dedication, focus and honesty are key to business in America. The one thing I, I really learned uh, from doing business here and I compare it to whenever I go back home is making sure you have top-notch customer service because that is the one thing a customer always remembers. Mm. Your food can be the most delicious food, but if you did not treat your customer right, mm -hmm. they will not have the urge of wow. coming back. Wow. So the, the most thing that I have learned in business in this country is customer service. Customer so when service. your customer service is five star and above, then you will always stay in business.
Vital lessons there about running a restaurant in the U.S. What a story. Mr. and Mrs. Momanyi met in a history class and they are making history together. With that, we come to the end of part one of this show. We now take a short break. When we return... We want to have some Kenyan street names. Mm -hmm. We want that uh, when the folks come in here, mm. they can tell that um, we were here. How 68 Kenyans in Dallas, Texas, have pulled resources for a massive affordable housing project. Welcome back and we go Mashambani now. Part two of this show is all about land and we join Patrick Nganga, one of the leaders of a group of 68 Kenyan investors in Dallas, Texas, who've pulled resources to put up a massive affordable housing project. So how did this begin, this idea? Well, this idea came about, mm. uh, you know, I've always been in the insurance business uh -huh. and one part of uh, helping people with insurance was uh, people asking me, what else can we do? Uh -huh. Where else can we put our money? Uh -huh. How can I diversify my portfolio? Mm -hmm. The Kenyan community the Kenyan in Dallas. Community, uh -huh. Yes, the Kenyan community in Dallas, uh -huh. in the United States in general. Mm -hmm. uh, we serve uh, all the states. Okay. So uh, that's how we came about. You know, mm -hmm. we were like, uh, real estate is booming. Mm -hmm. It's coming up. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to get involved in the, this uh, real estate business. Yes from the ground up because mm. you can start from a house that is existing already okay but someone has already taken their profit mm. you could know someone who built it mm. there's someone who sold it yeah uh -huh. so by the time you're getting it let's say as a rental property investment property yes all the profits has been eaten up by someone else uh -huh. so we said how about we be the ones that acquire the land develop it mm -hmm. and then we get all the profits mm -hmm. from the ground up mm -hmm. yeah yeah, I mean, this is interesting that uh, Kenyans abroad can buy land. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. So is it the normal way? I mean, it, the way you buy land here, is this the same way you would buy land in Kenya? <laughs> it's slightly different uh. because, um, you know, first of all, the authorities, uh, you, know, you know, want to make sure that the land use uh -huh. uh, has been, uh, you know, taken care of. Uh, zoning and then you have to go to uh, planning back and forth with mm -hmm. the city or mm -hmm. the county whichever jurisdiction you're in uh -huh. you know it's hard for us to just acquire land and say we want to build such and such yes. you know, even before you acquire it mm -hmm. you have to go to the existing local authorities and find out what exactly you can do with the land uh-huh yes and uh, so you eventually you'll get a title just the way you would get a title exactly. and own yes. land in america exactly wow yeah. that's yeah. there everyone gets yeah. their own deed uh -huh. they get uh, something to prove that they own it. So what's the name of the group? Uh, Lone Oak Eagle Station. Lone Oak Eagle Station? Yes. And how many members are we you? Are, we are 68 members uh, total uh -huh. uh, for this particular piece. So yes. 68 Kenyans came together uh -huh. to put resources together to uh -huh. buy this land. To buy this land. What's the area, the coverage? It's uh, 39 acres. 39 acres. Yes. Well done. That's uh, daring. Mm -hmm. So, and then, so the title belongs to the group? The title belongs to the group mm -hmm. all the way until we do uh, the development. Okay. So once the developments are done, mm -hmm. then uh, individuals, because well, the way we did it, because yeah. we already have the lots, we already know how many lots will come out of it. Uh -huh. So we kind of wanted to do it in a way that if one person wants to buy more than one lot, they mm -hmm. can do that. Uh -huh. So it's, it's a share kind of thing. Okay. You get one share is one lot. So the members mm -hmm. have lots mm -hmm. and the, that's how they'll benefit, see what they will want to do with the lots. Exactly. But then uh, what's the ultimate goal? What are you going to put up here in the land? Yes. So we're going to have, uh, this will be an affordable housing subdivision. Uh -huh. So homes ranging in about uh, $250,000 to $300,000, uh -huh. which right now is uh, the affordable uh, level uh -huh. right here in uh, the Dallas Fort Worth uh -huh. area. Uh -huh. Okay. So uh, the eventually, uh, once we do the roads, the subdivisions and everything, mm -hmm. then everyone will get their lot, depending on the number mm -hmm. of lots they were getting, mm -hmm. then they decide. So this is the map? This is the map of the area. Yeah. It shows we have uh, 174 uh, lots that we mm. come out of it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we enter our subdivision through this street. Mm -hmm. So it takes you all the way in. Uh, and then uh, they have many connections to go around. Mm. And then uh, back line, we have uh, the tree line. Mm. And then the back behind us is, uh, what, you know, they're calling it Lone Oak mm -hmm. um, ISD, mm -hmm. Independent School District. So we have a school just behind us. Uh -huh. Yeah, so the kids that will, the families that will be here, 
the children will be going to the school right behind us. Oh, wow. Yes, and then there is a, right here there is a, the sewer treatment plant. Mm -hmm. So all the wastewater treatment will be done right to the uh, southeast of us here. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we have some common areas. Yeah. So like here we're going to build a, a, a game place where people can, the kids can be playing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have uh, walking trails, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where there, there are trees. So we're going to kind of leave mm -hmm. the green belt. Mm -hmm. That way people can just sit there and relax, mm -hmm. go for a walk uh, within the subdivision. We want to have some street, Kenyan street names. Mm -hmm. We want that uh, when the folks come in here, mm -hmm. they can tell that um, we were here. Yeah. Wa Kenya walikuja hapa, wa yes. So how long has it taken you to just reach where you are, where you now own it, yes. you have the title you want to develop? So we, we owned uh, real quick because yeah. people were able to contribute it so fast. Yeah. You know, within a month we had sold out everything mm -hmm. to all the members. And then now uh, we've been going back and forth with the city, mm -hmm. getting the approvals, okay. getting the permitting, getting mm -hmm. uh, whatever we need to get started. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be doing our groundbreaking uh, end of this month, end, end of, of June. This month. How much did this cost? Yes, so uh, we were contributing per lot, per lot, mm. per share, mm -hmm. and everyone was paying $8,000. $8,000 $8, is yes. uh, well over one point something million yes, Kenyan yes. shillings. Yes, so we came to about uh, 1.4 uh, million, million Kenyan shillings. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. yes, so and then we included the cost of acquisition, mm. uh, the realtor costs, the sales costs and all that were all figured in. So yes. in total? Uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah, it was about 1.6 total. 1.6 million dollars. Dollars. Yes. 1.6 yes. million US dollars. This is 208 million Kenya shillings. Wow. Yeah. 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 Worth of invest, investment yeah. here. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. yes. yes. Nini ni mabazu America. Well done, uh, Peter. Yes. And, and you know, the, the, the funny thing is that, um, you know, you get it at that cost, mm. but the moment you, you just break ground, mm. it almost doubles to the dollar. Uh, so it'll be worth like about three million the moment you just do the so infrastructure. So yeah. that indicates the possible return on investment. Yes, yes, very high. Yeah. You know, the, the ROI on it yeah. is well over 200% return. Wow. Yes. We have other things coming up, mm. and uh, part of the reason why is because uh, this one was oversubscribed. Mm. You know, when we when we sent out word and asking people to join, mm. we had so many takers, there was an overflow. Uh -huh. So there's another project that we are getting into, and uh, for that project, we are going to do the all the approvals beforehand. Uh -huh. You know, this one we acquired the land and then did the approvals after acquisition. Mm -hmm. So now we want to do the approvals first, make sure everything is passed by the city. Mm -hmm. So by the time you buy into it, you get your own deed, mm -hmm. and then uh, those ones will be acre lots. Mm -hmm. We see it coming up, acre lots. So we are, we are coming up with a wait list. If somebody is interested, they can, uh, you know, be on our contact list and we can give them more information. And uh, what lessons have you learned? Mm -hmm. You could, uh, you know, apply to similar developments back home. Yes. Yeah. yeah I think I would say is uh, zoning situations. Uh, you also want to uh, make sure that uh, one of the biggest lessons by the way has to do with uh, how development the jurisdiction makes sure you do it the right way mm. so that the, the flow of water uh, does not cause flooding in the mm. property. Because, mm. you know, uh, right here in the U.S., uh, FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, mm. maps out the whole country to determine flood plains, flood zones, so that there's no flooding on, you know. So the, you can know beforehand, before you acquire property, mm. whether it's likely to flood. So that's one of the things we made sure as part of our due diligence that the land that people are get does not flood. Mm. But secondly, what happens is, because you know, you could acquire land and then develop it in, a, in such a way that flooding happens downstream. Mm. So what the city does here, and one of the biggest lessons I've learned is, they make sure that when you develop, the impact that you create does not cause flooding mm. anywhere else. Mm -hmm. That way, FEMA stays intact. Whatever, they, how they map the area stays intact. So I guess I would say, you know, maybe that's one of the things we could learn all of us is that, you know, yes, let's map out the whole country that people can know this, how flooding mm -hmm. happens and also control how development happens. You know, that way people are not developing in areas where, you know, water gets moved in a way that causes flooding in areas that are not supposed to flood anything. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the process of acquiring title? Yeah, process of acquiring title here is uh, very, very straightforward. What I've learned is very straightforward and then everything is public online so uh, if you looked up this property it will show you who owns it when you get your lot when you get your deed for your own acre for your own uh, mm. one acre or whatever size it is it's online so that way it cannot be owned by two people 
right now we have a shortage of homes in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. The demand. So you are solving some social problem. We, we mm -hmm. would like to think so. Well, yes. look at that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And these jobs are not even mm -hmm. Kenyans will benefit because we do want to work with people who the economic flow comes back to our community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that when we give jobs here, we know he's helping. You know his family and also people back home that way we can create an impact a positive impact uh, not just of ourselves here in the, you know texas in the united states wow. but also even wow. to back home wow. and yeah. then you see what comes into your pocket you're able pro guys to send back home yes. the other developments back home and that's contributing to remittance inflows in kenya absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely yes mm -hmm. because you know all these people the profits that you'll make from mm -hmm. uh, the homes building and the rental properties that you'll get it gives them that economic freedom, first mm. of all, because that's huge. If you ask a lot of people here, Kenyans, yeah, yes. we work so hard, mm. we, we want to build wealth, but at the same time, we kind of want to have some time off. Mm. You know, one of the things that we do here, we work so hard, and, they, and, and it's like, you know, we, we, you have to keep working to make that dollar. Uh -huh. But people are looking more towards, hey, can, how can I put my dollar to work for me as well? Wow. And then when my dollar is working, I can have the economic, you know, the, the financial freedom to visit back home, see my family, yeah. spend more time wow. with my, maybe my aging parents, mm -hmm. uh, visit my properties back home, you know, uh, it build more even, even uh, in real estate back home. So like you said, remittances. So they'll get mm -hmm. more money mm -hmm. to flow uh, back home. Now, well. Patrick, what would you want done, or maybe in terms of policy, mm -hmm. uh, to make you, your contributions back home even uh, more better, mm -hmm. more, more, more organized. What, what, what would you suggest? Yes. What should be done? Yes, I think number one, the biggest thing people would like to see is uh, transparency on how the funds are being used. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when they land into the government pockets, uh, that's a big one. Uh, secondly, um, you know, it still costs us a lot to transmit money. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, the, the, the exchange that I can get if I carry my own dollar going mm -hmm. back home mm -hmm. versus uh, how much I get when I sub, you know, transmit it online. Uh, there's, a, there's a difference. So, and that's a cost that maybe CBK can look into to see how they can lower the cost of, of those uh, online transfers of money. Mm. Uh, and, and then uh, another one would be maybe uh, ease of, when we do investments, people want to know that the investments are safe. And, and um, you know, right now we are, we are even though we are, we are Kenyans here in the United States or in, in abroad, uh, the issue of taxes, you will hear people talk about it mm. a lot. Mm. I know it's affecting people back home a lot even more. Uh, and I know the government has to collect taxes, but I think there's a balance between how much you charge in taxes mm. and how much you incentivize people mm. to contribute more towards the development of an area. So maybe that's something they can look at. Yes, try and collect your revenue, yes, but uh, you, you don't want to, 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 to hit me so hard mm -hmm. that I decide that, you know, that's too much, mm -hmm. I'm going to put my money in another country or, or I won't even send anything back home. Yeah. So there have to be those incentives. And, and I know it's tough for them, for the policy, uh, people who are doing the policy, but they can look at a balance and maybe consult more from outside that way they can get to know maybe how, how people are feeling. Wow. Yes. Congratulations to Patrick and his colleagues for pulling resources for that massive affordable housing project in Dallas, Texas. And you know what? We met Patrick and his colleagues at our ongoing Daring Abroad Investment Forums in the U.S. And that's the spirit of our forums, showcasing investment opportunities both home and away. This week, we've pitched tent in Houston. Yes, Houston. And next week, find us in Seattle. What a journey, what a roadshow. On behalf of my team at Champs Media and our partners, many thanks for watching and see you again next week.